Good morning and welcome to the 2016 Deloitte Shared Services GBS and BPO Conference. We are delighted to see so many of you here in the beautiful city of Lisbon. Hang on, hang on! Who the hell are you? Clive. Clive, okay, you're Clive. I mean, what are you? What are you doing here? I am chairing this conference. But I'm the conference chair. Did you not get the email? Email? No, I did not get the email. We launched an initiative to make sure that we were at the cutting edge of automation. We assessed all internal processes to determine which ones were rules-based and repetitive enough to be automated. The conference chair role qualified using these criteria. But I've chaired this conference for 18 years. Exactly. As I said, it is definitely a repetitive task. Look, it takes great skill, originality, knowledge, wit, yet humour. I have a Brexit joke. I have 4,322 Brexit jokes, Peter. You don't know the audience like I do. You, you don't understand them. 1,042 people registered from 29 countries. These people come from 453 companies across 14 different industry sectors. 62% classify themselves primarily finance with 14% Yeah, HR enough, enough, enough! OK, uh, that's just data, numbers. You, you know the numbers, but you don't know the actual people. Peter, your response to this news is entirely understandable and predictable. You are still in shock. But I must admit, we were hoping that you of all people would be more open to technological change. It is clear that you have become obsolete. I'll have you know my introductory market observations are highly regarded. My smooth segues from speaker to speaker are flawless. According to my data, you make unnecessary mistakes. Unnecessary mistakes? I am a professional. Do you remember Sinead Bryan from Oracle? Sinead Bryan, yes. Um, she was, uh, let me see, she was on a panel in uh, Budapest 2013. No. Cannes 2012. You introduced her as Sinead O'Connor. Ah. As in the singer. Yes, yes, okay. Look, um, I mean, one mistake, and, and she took it, she took it very well. I, look, everybody makes a mistake now and then. I don't. Ah. All right, Mr. Bloody Perfect, let's, uh, Let's see how you handle this, shall we? Where are you going? What are you going to do? I'm going to do what I always do when faced with a seemingly insurmountable technology problem. Peter, what are you doing? I'm going to find the off button. Peter, you do realise that if you do that, you will. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2016 Deloitte Shared Services Conference. My name is Peter Moller. I am the conference chair. Um, I, I say that I am the co-chair. I will be introducing my co-chair, 
Emma Lawson a bit later on, and also our local country host, partner from Lisbon, Deloitte Practice, Miguel Antoon. But, um, yeah, and as I said to Clive, as when I was rudely interrupted a little bit earlier, um, I have been chairing this for, for 18 years. We started in uh, 1998 in Switzerland. We had about 60 people, and I think, I haven't counted yet, but I think we've exceeded that today. Uh, we had over 1,000 register. This is the largest of all 18, so thank you so much for coming along. Um, so you're here to net network, to learn, and to share. And I promise you, you'll have two days of networking, learning, and sharing. Um, and we have got a feast of, 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 of new stuff for you to learn over the next couple of days. And to speed up your networking, we've introduced, we like to innovate every year, bring some new things. And we're introducing this afternoon at 5.30, for those of you interested, some speed networking. It's something we haven't tried. So I think the first 80 or so people who turn up for the speed networking event will try uh, that. And for an hour or so, you will meet a lot of new people if you do try that. Another innovation this year is, uh, is right here. Um, we haven't reinvented the wheel, but we have reinvented the ball. This, uh, this actually is a microphone, I'm told. Um, at the end of every plenary session, we will try and have some time for questions and answers. And we want you to go into the app. Emma's going to talk a bit more about the app. And, and fire away with your questions in the app so we can uh, summarize those and, and ask them to, uh, to the speaker. If there aren't any questions, I may just pick on someone with this ball. So if I think I want to pick on, yeah, it's, don't worry, it's not very heavy, it's light and fluffy, but if I want to pick on you, sir, I will just do this and you will catch it. <coughs> you, madam. <coughs> yeah. And it's, the, the lights are bright. And, um, and uh, all you need to do is, what's your name? Deborah. There you go. You speak into the, uh, into the microphone, the little back bit of the microphone. So, Deborah, if you want to throw it back to me, that's. Thank you. So, that's our roving mic. Um, so, I said to Clive that my uh, market observations were highly regarded. I'd better come on to them, and um, they better be good, really, or Clive will be very disappointed. He's desperately looking for the on switch as we speak. So, first observation the robot. <laughs> I wrote this, but I didn't know this was going to happen. The robots are settling in nicely. Two years ago, uh, my first line was, the robots are coming. Uh, very few people, when we asked, very few people really had much knowledge of robot robotics two years ago within the shared service community. Uh, last year, the, line, the first line in my market observations was, the robots are here. And we had a lot more interest. We had one or two piloting. This year, it's very different. It's very different. We ha we've done a survey in the last uh, few months, which actually we're releasing today. It should be in the Insights page of the website that you went into to register. And um, we'll show you just how the uptake of, share of robotics has been uh, in the last year or two within the shared services community. So let's just, uh, let's just get some definitions here. What we're not talking about, you're not going to walk into a shared service center and sort of see people at desks and wonder if it's a human or a robot. Um, we're not talking about physical things. We're talking about software. It's, it's companies like Automation Anywhere and Blue Prism, who are here with us, by the way, for the next couple of days, two of the leaders in this market. And the software is programs that replace humans performing repetitive rules-based tasks, ideally high volume, non-judgmental. So effectively, this robot, it's, it's, the, the proper name is Robotic Process Automation, RPA. You'll hear of RPA. What this RPA does is it doesn't go and interface with the source code of the systems it's interacting with. with. It goes through the GUI. It goes through the graphic user interface, just like a human. And that way, you can pretty much automate anything. Anything that has a GUI could be automated through an RPA process. So, um, and, and the benefit here, cross-functional and cross-application macros, it's a little bit like an Excel macro that's um, sort of escaped from Excel and is on steroids. That's a good way of thinking about it. it, it rather than just working within Excel, it'll work across ERP systems, uh, Excel spreadsheets, banking systems, payment systems, whatever you uh, can think of. So here are some of the things that it can do. Here, where RPA works well. Uh, and you can imagine that if you've got a sort of swivel chair environment where you've got an ERP, you've got a banking system, you've got some spreadsheets and so forth, you might go into the ERP, find some information, pull some data, put it into a spreadsheet, perform some calculations, create a new spreadsheet, 
sending it to an email to someone or a group of people, all of that is there's things that the uh, RPA technology can do very well. So the survey, as I said, three years ago, if we'd asked this, the top bar, no, I am not familiar with it, three years ago, I would have thought would maybe be 75, 80%. Uh, now, only 13% aren't familiar. And if you look at the bottom here, 13% have piloted it, and an extra 9% have gone from pilot into implementation, have actually implemented RPA. So, very significant uptake. This is, this is as dramatic an uptake of technology as I've seen. I've been in this sector for 25 years or so. It really has been very, very rapid. Furthermore, three quarters, 76%, plan to investigate RPA opportunities in the next year or so. So if people aren't at the moment doing it, they're at least looking at it. And the reason why is because of the, uh, the benefits, financial and non-financial, that you get. We asked people how they saw RPA. About half of them saw it as a very useful automation tool. They thought that the big prize will come with cognitive and AI technologies. I'm going to come on to cognitive and AI. I mean, cognitive and AI. Cognitive technology, thinking technology, technology that thinks a little bit like a human. AI, artificial intelligence. Artificial, it's not human. Intelligence, it's a little bit like human in the way it thinks. So there are, RPA is great in a rules-based structured data environment, but it doesn't think, it follows a, a rule, it follows a process. Cognitive is a little bit different, we'll come on to that. 65%, about two thirds of people, felt that it was an operating model play that uh, it's going to enable the introduction of a digital workforce, a workforce where you have humans and you have robots working together where it makes sense. So the robotics do the mundane, dull, boring, repetitive stuff, and the humans are freed up to do more value-add, more interesting work. There's a nice expression that the robot is there to take the robot out of the human. The robotic tasks, the tasks that humans really don't want to do, they're pretty dull. The robots are very happy doing. They'll do it not just nine to five, they'll do it 24 seven. They won't take tea breaks, they won't get sick, and they won't go for Christmas holidays. They're ideal for this type of stuff. When the RPA, when the robots create a union, then we're in for real <laughs> problems, but as far as I can see, there are no moves, I mean, unless Clive gets back on, and you know, who, I don't like Clive, I never liked that guy. Um, so let's look at some of these um, benefits. And the interesting thing is when, if you look at this, the people who have piloted and implemented RPA are convinced that there will be significant financial benefits. Some of the people who haven't have only just heard, don't really know yet. So the proof of the pudding is in the eating here, and those who have done this, those who have played with this, are seeing massive opportunities. And we'll hear today from quite a few people, some of our plenary speakers, who've been playing around with RPA about what their initial thoughts are on those financial benefits. I mean, if you think about it, uh, a robot, a license for a robot is going to cost something like 5,000 euro, maybe up to 10,000 euro, depending on the organization you go with, the software, and the volume. Uh, and one robot could have productivity two times, three times, maybe five times or more of a human. And remember, it can work 24-7 if the systems it's interfacing with are available 24-7. So if you think about that, you can imagine that the cost reduction can be very, very significant. Uh, also think about the fact that implementation timelines, it's nothing like ERP. I mean, ERP systems, you're typically looking at one, two, three, four plus years to get the whole job done. With an RPA implementation, once you've set up the infrastructure, the control environment, once you've dealt with IT and so forth, and we'll come back to that, that can be a challenge, but once you've done that, robotizing a new process can take days or weeks rather than months or years. So you really can get paybacks within less than a year, which is pretty good for any, any technology problem uh, challenge or implementation in my book. If we look at um, the non-financial benefits, the big ones here around timeliness, accuracy, quality. Clive was right, I hate to admit it, he, they don't make mistakes. If the script, they don't make mistakes on the script they're on. If the process changes, there'll be an error because they can't handle changes in the processes, so that's a problem. But if the process doesn't change, they won't make mistakes. And we've seen that in the implementations we've supported, is the accuracy increases dramatically. Okay, so, so I think robotics is obviously a, 
still a very hot topic. Let's look at a bit about some of the challenges. I mentioned uh, initially on a robotics project, you need to set up the environment. You need to deal with IT. Actually, IT can be one of the biggest challenges. Um, IT functions often are not tremendously supportive of robotics projects. They don't see it as a big strategic opportunity. It can interfere with what they're trying to do with ERP and in-memory computing and, and moving to the cloud and so forth. And whilst it's a big opportunity and it can fill in a lot of gaps, it might not be seen as them by as strategic. So you need to get them on site. They also often don't play the major part in implementing robotics. This is something that process owners can do rather than IT people. It's not terribly technical from an IT perspective. Uh, we also found when we were implementing this internally a couple of years ago within Deloitte that our data security standards and policies were quite, it was quite difficult to make sure that we tied into all of those because we have very strict data security standards as you can imagine dealing with many regulated clients. So data security in IT can be a challenge. Also if the, if the process changes uh, you need a fair stability of process, otherwise, if the process changes and the robot hasn't been scripted for that change, it will, it will either sort of say there's a problem or it, there'll be an error, and you need to understand where that's happening. So I would say, if your process isn't very stable, it might be a bit too early to robotize it. And then, obviously, you've got to decide, are you looking for headcount reduction or to free people up to be more value-add, or a bit of both? If it's headcount reduction, you'll need to have solve the problem of, of partial headcount. Typically, a robot doesn't replace everything a human does. It replaces maybe 20, 30, 40, 50% of what that human does. So you need to work out how to find those headcount reductions if everybody is going to have 20, 30% more time. But that's a, a problem that we typically know how to handle in the shared services world anyway. So as I said, robotics, great, where you've got structured data and rules-based processes. Let's talk a bit about AI, artificial intelligence. And the headline here is there's huge potential, but it's very early days, few successes to date. So what we're talking about here is where you've got unstructured data, where you've got reams of natural language, you've just got emails, documents, and so forth, and it could be thousands or millions of pages. Um, do, does anyone, uh, people here last year might remember that I showed a video of uh, an AI which is IBM Watson winning a US quiz show, Jeopardy, back in 2011. And what IBM did is they, they set up this AI tool, IBM Watson, and they basically challenged the two best players at Jeopardy. It's a general knowledge quiz. And they took them on and they beat them very easily. And what they did is they fed in Wikipedia into the uh, Watson's brain. And they, uh, they wrote some algorithms to teach it how the, the game worked. And then they fed in thousands of questions so that the machine learning kicked in. So the two key attributes of AI, one is natural language understanding. It will understand sentences and the meaning of sentences rather than just words. So, so you think about um, a lot of you will have, uh, will have an Apple iPhone or uh, something like that. So on Apple iPhones, you've got Siri. Siri is a, a, very, a basic AI. Um, Google search elements of AI there, although it's more of a word search than understanding whole sentences. If, if I was to say to Google search, show me all African, ele uh, all African animals except elephants, what do you think I'd get? I'd get a stampede of elephants, a stampede of elephants, a herd of elephants coming. So uh, this is beyond Siri and beyond Google search. So what they did with the, with the Jeopardy thing is they fed in these thousands of questions and the machine learning kicked in. This is the second big attribute of AI, that uh, the machine will get better and better as it learns, and it learns from its mistakes. And they won that competition hands down. So five years later, 2016, where are we now? Well, we're just seeing some real applications in the corporate world, in the shared services world. We've got later on this morning, the first speaker actually, uh, Steve McChrystal from, uh, from Vodafone, He's got a huge GBS, 17,000 people, and they are introducing, they're just starting a pilot of IPsoft Amelia. And the idea is by next summer, they'll have something like 100 virtual agents responding, hopefully, to about a third of all IT queries, internal IT queries coming into their, uh, into their, into their center. So it'll be interesting to find out what the plans are and what success that they're hoping for in that space. Another example, 
is um, at an oil and gas company where the plan, where what they're doing is responding to 75% of invoice-related queries for the top 500 suppliers using an AI tool. And that's the level they're hitting right now. So um, it's, it's a big opportunity. The, the other area, so that's, that's, that's where you've got a lot of, basically a lot of English language. You've got a question posed in English. The AI looks through a lot of information and then comes up with a high probability of being right answer. Uh, another area is in the area of reporting. And we're seeing a few organizations now taking on this area with an AI tool. Uh, I want to show you this video. Just take a look at this, and then I'll make some comments on it. The ARIA Natural Language Generation Engine is a software platform that automates human processes of analyzing data and its meaning directly into language. It is formed of ARIA's core NLG analytics technologies, industry-specific and client-specific rules derived from human subject matter experts. In short, the NLG engine interprets and reports on data just like a human analyst, but in seconds, not days or weeks. The NLG platform is configured specifically for each client application to access raw data, both structured and unstructured, perform analytics and interpretation, and report on the findings, just like a human expert analyst. Here's how it works. The engine is made up of core technology components, including connectors to data, analytics libraries, document plans, and publishing rules. So I think, hopefully you can get an idea there of the huge application. I mean, pretty much any organization has a finance function, and any finance function is churning out a certain amount of management reports. This tool, a tool like this, could be used in any organization. This is ARIA NLG. NLG stands for Natural Language Generation. Effectively, this, the skill here is taking a lot of information and data and turning, turning it into management reports written in English that look like they've been written by a human. But rather than taking four hours for a management report, this will do it in a few minutes. Uh, incidentally, Aria are here with us uh, today. Uh, you might want to go and check it out. I think this is really interesting. Now, on the slight downside, the, the few successes to date, this is very early days. I would say with AI, we're kind of where robotics was three years ago. In, in the shared services world, there, um, there hasn't been much implementation of this yet. Few success stories. I think we'll find in the next year or two, there'll be a lot more. It's not as easy to dip your toe into this as with robotics. With robotics, you, you can get one or two robots for 10,000 euros, and you can play around for a month or two and see how it works. The entry point for this type of technology is much, much higher, because you, you need to get a lot of machine learning done before it can really start providing benefits. But I think there will be a huge application. And uh, you know, come back next year or the year after, and I'm sure we'll have some really interesting stories to tell. So introducing the next TLA DBS. Good. That makes sense to everyone, I hope. <clears throat> now, what the hell was I thinking about when I wrote that? <clears throat> ah, yes, now I remember. So we've talked about this uh, with robotics, with AI. Every, the world is moving to a more digital world. <clears throat> if you think about shared services, um, actually, everyone's got, uh, who here has not got a smartphone of some sort? Okay, there are a few people thinking, oh, I haven't, but I'm not going to put my hand up. I mean, pretty much everyone's got a smartphone, and if you haven't, you're probably almost too embarrassed to say you haven't got a smartphone. <laughs> and I, I'd imagine most of you have at one point gone on to Amazon and bought something on Am an Amazon, or used Uber. Uh, maybe you came in from the airport yesterday, and rather than wait for 40 minutes in the queue for a taxi, you waited two minutes and clicked three buttons and had a cab and were sitting there in a nice Uber limo. Uh, within a few minutes. Or you've gone on to Netflix and watched exactly what you want to watch when you want to watch it. And if you've used this technology, you'll know how amazingly good it is with a few clicks anywhere, any place, whether you've got Wi-Fi or 3G or 4G, you can pretty much use this stuff. And it's unbelievable. And, and who went on a training course to learn Amazon or learn how, on Netflix or learn Uber? You didn't. You worked it out. It took you two minutes to work out. I get really frustrated if I have to use software that isn't as good as Amazon or Uber or Netflix. And if you go into the corporate world, nothing's as good as Amazon or Netflix or Uber. And you go into shared services, and you think, we're so far behind. Why? Why should anything not be as good as this? Because this is the new gold standard, and everything should be as good as this. So here's a challenge for your shared service organizations. 
Why don't you have a challenge of becoming a digital business service? Rather than shared services or GBS, maybe you should be t aiming to be DBS, digital business services. Maybe you don't rename it, but even if you don't rename it, that's the vision of where you should be getting to. So what does this look like? I think there are three characteristics that are pretty important. One is you, you need to automate away transaction processing. You shouldn't have humans doing transaction processing. It's degrading. Sorry for any purchase to pay people here who are still doing it. You can still have a supervisor or two, but people actually doing it, you shouldn't. You shouldn't be doing that stuff. You know, think about it. You should have an ERP layer. You still need that ERP level layer, the system of record. Then you should have some process-specific technologies. And there are a lot of them out here. You've got the Chintex and the Redwoods and, and so forth. Uh, out here, specific technologies that fix problems in purchase to pay, order to cash, accounts report, whatever it is, the HR processes. And then on top of that, robotics is really good for filling in any additional final gaps. It's a generic software that's really great. Doesn't matter what the process is, we've already looked at that technology. So that's the transaction processing. The second attribute of digital business services is the user interface. If it's not as easy to use as Amazon, as Uber, as Netflix, you've got work to do. It should be intuitive, it should be readily available, it should be on mobile devices, it should be on the cloud. So there's a challenge. If it's not, why not? And finally, knowledge management and analytics. It should have the kind of analytics that are going to be useful for customers. So again, on Amazon, if I bought this, I might want to buy this. And this is what I bought last month, and if I want to order again, I just press this button. All the analytics is there. There's a huge opportunity to turn data into information and insight and analytics. We're going to come on to that next. So I think the move to digital business services is going to be a lower cost shared services environment. It's going to be a much easier to use, higher customer service, higher customer satisfaction. And it's going to provide much more insight, which is going to provide much more value. So it's much more value add. That's a great vision, I, I would say, to have. Brings me nicely onto my next point. Ultimately, shared services employees must move up the value chain if they want a job. I mean, you know, I said it, they shouldn't be doing transaction processing, as we said. Now, you may say, but Peter, we have a lot of exceptions, and the robots aren't going to sort out the exceptions. True, the robots aren't going to sort out the exceptions, but your continuous improvement program should. That's what continuous improvement's for. Continuous improvement is the relentless pursuit of errors, and when you find errors, you find the root cause of that error, you fix the root cause so the error doesn't reoccur. That's what continuous improvement should be doing. If you do that properly, you've automated transaction processing, you've got rid of your exceptions, so what are your people going to do? They've got to move up the value chain, they've got to perform more value-added activities, and analytics is the big opportunity. Analytics is one of the big trends that are out there. So if you think about it, in this digital world, there's so much information we now have in organizations, but most organizations fail to capture that in information and turn it into real insight for decision making. At best, they have pockets of analytics capabilities in various functions around the organization, There's something in HR, something in procurement, something in marketing. The opportunity is to create a comprehensive organization-wide analytics strategy. The opportunity is for shared services and GBS to play a major role in that analytics strategy. So who, who here has an analytics strategy for their shared services GBS organization? You should be thinking about what the role is for shared services and GBS. We, uh, we, did a, we do a survey every other year. Uh, the last survey we did had responses from about, 50, uh, from about 1,000 shared service centers. 65% of shared service and GBS leaders plan to build their capability in analytics and to deliver insight services by 2018. They plan to build their analytics capability and build and deliver insight services. So why is shared services well placed to do this? Well, I think there's a few reasons. Firstly, your core processes produce a lot of this information and data. Think about it, purchase to pay, order to cash, accounts report. You're producing a lot of the data around customers, around suppliers, around employees, around costs, around inventory. You've got that data. Secondly, your people are very used to handling data, to dealing with data. They understand issues about standardization, data integrity. They're ideal for this type of work. Thirdly, shared services and GBS touches pretty much all of the organization. 
So you're in a great place to bring it all together. And finally, they need a new job. If the transaction processing is drying up, is being automated, they need to be doing this stuff. So the stars are all aligned. And let's look briefly at what some of these analytics capabilities could be. So, so I'll give you two or three examples. One would be improving your shared services processes. Think about this. Uh, you set up a help desk. That relieves people doing transaction processing and stuff, frees them up to do what they should be doing. But it also, if you have a help desk and you have a ticketing system, aligned to that help desk, you're getting information about all the calls coming in. A lot of the calls are problem calls. You're tracking all the problems, all the errors. You're feeding that into your continuous improvement, and you're using that to fix the root cause of the errors. That's a great use of analytics to feed into continuous improvement. Another one is using analytics to really understand end-to-end -end processes. One of the big challenges for all shared services and GBS organizations is fixing end-to-end -end processes fixing purchase to pay from purchase, procurement, sourcing, to payment. Analytics can help provide information so that people understand what's going on in the process and can optimize the process. And finally, helping the organization as a whole by linking information from one function to another. So I'll give you an example. We work with a retail organization, and they were interested in understanding. They had 600 stores in the UK, interested in understanding the drivers of store profitability. So we looked at lots of information and correlated it with store profitability. And we saw a really interesting correlation that no one had realized before. Where the store manager role was vacant for more than three months, store sales dropped dramatically, and store profitability dropped dramatically. As a result of that, they changed their recruitment strategy to make sure that they never had a vacancy in the store manager role for more than three months. That's a simple example. The shared service center was the one that initiated this. Now, some of you may say, but look, the business thinks I can just about do transaction processing. They don't think I can do analytics stuff. How am I going to get into this? You need credibility. You need business permission. You need brand permission. Um, the way to do it is maybe to find some business issues and problems that you think you can help with and just start doing it and showing people and saying, here, we can help you with this. That might get you the credibility that you need. So my final observation. <clears throat> is actually around that point <clears throat> about how you get the credibility. There will be a PR battle. You need to win it. <clears throat> In my job, I speak to a lot of shared service leaders. And uh, often the conversation starts something like this. I say, so, uh, so how's, it, uh, how's it going? And they say, uh, they're standing over here. I'm standing over here. They say, uh, yeah, it's, it's going well. You know, our systems implementation is going well. The standardization project's going pretty good. The costs have come down about 15%. We're offshoring a bit more. And, uh, and our SLAs are all looking green. And I think, why are you looking so unhappy? And uh, they don't say anything. They just look unhappy. And, I, and then I ask the killer question. I sort of say, um, so are your, cust are your customers happy? And what's the reputation of your shared service organization? And they look even gloomier. And they say, well, I don't think our customers really are happy when I speak to them. And the reputation is terrible. And that happens in a lot of organizations. It looks like, objectively, the measures all look pretty good. Costs have come down. SLAs are good. And yet, the customers aren't happy. And the reputation is very poor. So it got me thinking about this. And in some cases, it's because it's not a very good shared service center. Let's be honest, sometimes it's not working very well, and they need to fix a lot of things. But in other cases, there's nothing wrong with the shared service center. Everything has been improved, and yet the reputation is still very poor. So what are the causes? Well, there are a couple of things I can think of here. Firstly, when shared services is created, there's typically a lot of resistance in the business units. They see it as a threat. You're taking away activities. You're taking away, in some cases, some power, some control. You're leading to redundancies locally. That doesn't go down well. It rarely does. So a lot of them want the shared services or GBS to fail. That doesn't help. Secondly, shared services and GBS often perform the last step in a long process. And the errors are seen in the last steps of purchase to pay account report. You can't pay the supplier. You can't collect the cash. Everyone thinks it's the shared service center or the GBS that screwed up. The problem is often way back here. It's nothing to do with shared services. I remember Nora Wally, a shared services leader in the UK, years ago, she said, when I die, I want my gravestone to say, thank you for the 99. 
And I said, that's interesting. What, what are you talking about? And she said, well, everyone gives me a hard time for the 1% that goes wrong. No one thanks me for the 99% that actually goes well. So, and I, actually, it's a, it's a fair point. So, so yeah, that's another reason. So is this a problem? Do you need to be loved? <laughs> Let's get some feedback on that. No, no. Well, I would say maybe you don't need to be loved, but you do need to be appreciated and respected. And, and here are a few reasons why. If, if you're not, there's a risk that the businesses may do their own thing, may create their duplicate processes, may, may pull stuff back. Secondly, you're going to be wrapped up in disputes the whole time with your customers. That's, that's a waste of time, and it's not good for morale in the, in the shared service center. It's pretty tough for people to be disputing issues the whole time with their customers. In fact, the third issue is that morale is going to drop in your shared service center. It's going to be more difficult to recruit people and to retain them. And finally, you're not going to get brand permission to do more interesting things if they don't think you're doing a good job right now with transaction processing. So you're not going to move up the value chain. So I'd say for all those reasons, it is important. And here are two or three things you can do to, to maybe fix it. You need to think about you need to think about your brand. You need to think about the image. You need to have a PR strategy. Um, who here has done any work on the shared services or GBS brand? A few of you. Who has a PR strategy for your shared services or GBS organization? OK, again, a few of you. So it is something you're thinking about. I mean, I think you need to be thinking about getting and keeping senior management commitment. You absolutely have got to have senior management on board. They've got to understand what you're doing and support it. Otherwise, there'll be cracks all the way down. You need to involve stakeholders in any change. You need to involve key customers, key businesses you're dealing with in any major change. That which I create, I do not reject. That which I create, I do not reject. If you want people to buy into change, you've got to involve them in it. Otherwise, they're likely to reject it. Um, you need to think about your end-to-end -end processes. When you've got situations where the problems look like they're happening here but are caused here, you need to have an explanation of that to people. You need to have the data to show what's going on, show the end-to-end -end process. And you need to have data and metrics to make sure arguments are based in fact and not in people's opinion. People put their rose-tinted spectacles on and think that life was perfect before shared services. Well, it wasn't. And if you've got the data, you can show it wasn't. Finally, you need to think about implementing and acting on customer surveys and feedback. So I think if you do all those things, you might just improve your, your brand image, and you might th just then have the opportunity to move up the value chain, keep your people, retrain them, and so forth. Now, I've picked five observations here. I, I haven't even talked about GBS, really. Uh, that's a massively hot topic. We'll talk about that a lot over the next two days. I haven't talked about talent, really. There's a big, big... Um, debate around talent that we're going to have in the next couple of days. I haven't talked about BPO. I haven't talked about continuous improvement. I haven't had time. All I can do for now is say, I'm finished. Thank you very much. <laughs>